Let me start preaching quickly. While the offering is being taken, I'm sure we'll collect more money. <laughs> Maybe we need to move it to when I'm preaching so that there's more money. Well, um, we're going to, uh, uh, we, we've sort of lost time for obvious reasons, but uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to let you off easy. This is going to be a long one. But the good news is if you look on my left, your right, there are tables. And very soon those tables will be filled with food. So I have no guilt about preaching for the next two hours because we'll also feed you. All right, so buckle up, uh, stretch if you need to stretch to go drink water because this is not going to be a short one. Um, are the baptism candidates back? Could you please stand, those who've just been baptized? Okay, four, five, six, seven, eight. I didn't see one. All right, so I believe they have all applied for membership. Am I right? Uh, okay, yes. So we are introducing them for, uh, 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 to you the members of Hillview Baptist Church, that these uh, brothers and sisters have applied for membership and are ready to take that step. We have two weeks. The testimonies will be emailed in the course of the week. Uh, get to know them. Shake their hand. Uh, find out their name. Find out what you can about them. Have a chat with them. If you can have them home for lunch in these two weeks, do it. Uh, so that uh, if there are any issues or concerns, you let us know. But also, they are joining our membership family, so uh, let's give them a warm welcome. So just turn around, especially those of you who are in front, so that everybody sees your faces. All right, so these are the nine. Thank you, uh, the eight. Thank you very much. You may take your seats. All right, let's get into this uh, little marathon. We are in Matthew 3, Matthew 3, verse 13 to 17. It's always a delight to baptize people who have come to repentance and faith. This was uh, something that Jesus Christ left for us in our marching orders as the church to go into all the world and uh, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, baptizing them. So it is right in the marching orders of the church. And that's why we need to pray for more and more baptisms. Um, I want us to look at the baptism of Christ and draw their principles for why every believer should be baptized. Matthew 3, beginning at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, to John, John the Baptist, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, John the Baptist, consented or agreed. And when Jesus was baptized immediately, he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now, many theologians men who I respect, pastors who've preached on this passage, have specifically warned against doing what I'm about to do this morning. Uh, they've discouraged using the baptism of Jesus 
as an application for why believers must be baptized and they are, they, they are right to be concerned that we don't use it in that way. Uh, this is a big thing that is happening in, um, in this passage. And, uh, you know, Jesus, uh, th there's, just to give you a, a hint, for instance, there's the whole Trinity in this passage. In fact, this is one of the, the passages we go to to argue for why the Trinity is not just one person who is sort of uh, taking three modes but it is actually three persons because each person is playing a distinct role. God, it's not possible for God to be both the Son and the Spirit as well uh, because it's, it's clear they are distinct roles. So, uh, but also it's huge. This is the start of Jesus Christ's ministry and this is how Jesus Christ chose to launch in the baptism pool. So this is certainly way bigger than us and I concede that, and it's certainly the, the, uh, not the primary application to us to be baptized. However, I'm going to go against that and still draw some principles for our own baptism. I think there is something here. You'll be the judges of whether I am uh, straining the text too hard. I'm sure you'll give me some good feedback afterwards. Last week, we were, uh, from Monday to Saturday, we, we had our prayer and fasting, and today we've had our baptism. Jesus Christ went through something similar, only that for him it was in reverse. He started with the baptism at the end of Matthew 3, and then uh, went into 40 days of prayer and fasting in, at the beginning of Matthew 4. I want us to zero in on the account of his baptism and see why every believer must be baptized and must make baptism an important thing in their hearts and in their minds. Three things from the text. Number one, every believer must be baptized because it is the believer's first formal act of obedience. Every believer must be baptized because it is the believer's first formal act of obedience. In verse 15, Jesus, uh, you know, John says in 14, Hey, why are you coming to me? I need to be baptized by you. You know, this is wrong here. I need to be getting baptized by you. Uh, Jesus responds in verse 15, Let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Only then did John agree. We are told uh, in, you notice that the passage begins, verse 13, with the word then. Then Jesus came from Galilee. We are told where Jesus was coming from when he came to be baptized. He was coming from the province of Galilee. That was his home province. Uh, in, in the province of Galilee, his hometown was Nazareth. In fact, look at the ending of chapter 2 of Matthew, verse 23. It says, And he, Jesus, having come back from Egypt with his parents, lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. And then John the Baptist comes in, the baptizer on the scene in Matthew chapter 3, until the two collide at the end of chapter 3. Nazareth was Jesus' hometown uh, in the province of Galilee. That's where he spent most of his 30 years. Those were 30 years of silence. We pretty much have nothing, zilch zero from those many years that Jesus Christ spent you know his uh, years as an older boy getting into his teenage years becoming a man getting a trade to be a carpenter no idea we've got no idea it's complete silence 
he had spent all that time quietly working away as a carpenter. And you need to, why is that in, interesting? Because we only have three years, really, of his life. Because once he emerges from silence and obscurity, all we get is three years and is dead and is risen, and 40 days later he is gone. So Jesus spent most of his life living in quietness and obscurity in Galilee, in the town of Nazareth. We know that he spent a long time there because his accent was from that area. His disciple Peter was recognized. Uh, by the way, all his disciples came from there. You know, uh, Peter was, uh, well, most of them. Peter's accent was, was recognized to be a Galilean accent. We, and so Jesus would have had an accent, just like, you know, Tongas. You can tell, ah, you think you are Tonga. Jesus had that, and so we know he spent so much time there. We know he spent a long time there because when he began his ministry for these short three years and began preaching, the people of his hometown did not believe in him. That's how we know he spent a long time there. His life was so ordinary in Galilee and in Nazareth that when he began now preaching, after being quiet for 30 years, making people's chairs, when he now got out of that line of work and said, I'm actually the son of God, they laughed at him. Literally. You know, it's like the guy who used to play football with or the girl you used to spend all your time with. Uh, after, without telling you anything, suddenly says, I'm the, you know, I'm now, uh, you know, the, ch the, the greatest person who ever lived. I mean, you just laugh and say, come on. We spent 30 years together, whatever, growing up. You never mentioned the word. And now you want us to believe these big ideas about you. That's what happened for Jesus. He's, he spent so much time there. His life was so ordinary there that it, it affected the people of his hometown and, and predisposed them not to believe that he was the son of God and the Messiah. And that's why we get the famous line, uh, that actually comes from scripture. A prophet is without honor in his hometown. That's where that comes from. Matthew 13, verse 53. Yes, I want you to turn to these passages. Matthew 13, 53. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. And coming to his hometown... He taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished. The people of his hometown were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? I thought this guy was just sitting making chairs. Where did he learn all the things that he is preaching? You learn that in the synagogue. You don't learn that making chairs in the carpentry shop. Verse 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? They knew him. That's the chap, the son of Joseph. Joseph died and is now taken over the trade. He now runs the family business after his father died. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judah? We know this guy. Verse 56. Are, and are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said, the prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. They missed out. And the only reason they missed out on the wonder-working power of Jesus and missed out on believing in him is because he was so ordinary. Just a common guy for 30 years. And when he started talking big, they couldn't buy it. They couldn't be convinced by it. Mark actually says that Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. He couldn't believe their unbelief. Their unbelief made him be unbelieving. He was shocked. What is going on here? 
So this is evidence of a very ordinary life. So when Jesus leaves his hometown to launch his ministry, the first item on his agenda is what? Baptism. The question is why? Why did Jesus need to be baptized? What was the purpose of his baptism? Now you will not get, you will get so many answers for this. It's, it's almost mysterious. And the reason it is mysterious is because the baptism of John was different from the baptism we do today. Uh, the baptism we do today is baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. When John came on the scene, there was no Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus was there, but he was making chairs. And so when John came on the scene, uh, he, his baptism was not in the name of Jesus. His baptism was a baptism of? Repentance. Make sure you come for Bible studies at 9 o'clock eh? so that you're able to answer these kinds of questions. His baptism was a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe, Acts 19 verse 4, to believe in the one who was to come after him, which was Jesus. And so this is what makes the baptism of Jesus completely perplexing the the baptism sorry the baptism yes the baptism of jesus john's baptism that he was conducting were for those who were ready to repent and believe and trust on the messiah that john was saying i've come here to prepare the ground for the messiah those of you who are ready to repent of your sins and believe in the messiah who will be coming i'll baptize you and it will be a baptism of repentance. Now, that Jesus completely uh, does not need that baptism. Jesus needs to repent of nothing. He has no sin. And Jesus certainly doesn't need to believe in himself. And so it's completely not applicable to, um, to, to Jesus. So the question remains, why? Why did he choose to launch why did he choose his big statement, his big arrival, his big, big announcement? Those of you who are musicians and launch albums, and you say, come and listen to the launch of my... This was the launch for Jesus. Why pick a baptism that completely did not apply to him and was completely irrelevant to him? There's a clue in the text, and it is to fulfill all righteousness. At least that's what he says. And this is why John struggled. Why? If anything, you should baptize me. You are the sinless, spotless lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the people. I am a sinner. You know, you should baptize me. Why are you now asking me to baptize you? Well, Jesus says, let's do this for the sake of fulfilling all righteousness. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't solve the problem either because uh, there is nowhere in the law that it was required for Jesus to be baptized. Nowhere. So why, why is Jesus talking about this? Whatever his reason for choosing and insisting on being baptized, one thing is clear, and this is my point. Jesus makes his first formal act of obedience. The very thing, listen to me carefully, Jesus makes his first formal act of obedience the very thing that he will require of all his disciples who would come after him. Where we need to start as disciples of Jesus Christ in that pool there, that's what Jesus chose to start with for his ministry. Jesus goes first on a path that he plots for all who would believe in him. Baptism was not a requirement for Jesus, but it is a requirement for us. It's in our marching orders. Go therefore, Jesus told his disciples, into all the world and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All people upon becoming followers, disciples of Jesus Christ, upon becoming believers in Jesus Christ, need to be baptized by the explicit command of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm not going to get into the debate of why he was baptized, but I'm going to say that Jesus makes his first formal act of obedience, what he will require for us to make our first formal act. Why is this important? Because we tend to do, make two mistakes with baptism. We overestimate it or underestimate it. We overestimate it when we think that to be saved we need to be baptized. In a crowd this size, I have no doubt if I was to send a text to all of you and say respond and tell me why you think you are a Christian. Respond and tell me privately, DM me. Why do you think you are going to heaven? Why do you think you may stand a chance of going to heaven despite your sins, which you know are many? I'm pretty sure at least five will reply and say, I was baptized. I'm baptized. And we hear it all the time as we ask people, why do you say you are a Christian and baptized? Why do you think God will accept you in heaven because I'm baptized? That is to overestimate Baptism. That is to make it too big in our eyes. Baptism does not save us from our sins. In fact, the Bible literally says it in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, when it says, Baptism now saves you not as a removal of debt from the body. Baptism can do nothing to wash you spiritually of your sinfulness so that God accepts you. It can't remove the debt of your sins. It can't remove the record of your sins that God has in heaven. The best it can do is to be an appeal to God for a good conscience. That's what 1 Peter 3 verse 21 in other words, baptism is symbolic of one who has been saved, not one who wants to be saved, not one who's hoping to be saved. It's symbolic. It's an appeal for a good conscience to stand in that pool and say, I have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and trusted him for my salvation. I can stand here before these witnesses and make that proclamation. Then we baptize, not to save you, but to make this testimony to to give this witness this public witness to all who are watching so baptism cannot save you on the flip side there are those of us who underestimate baptism and the fact that jesus would choose to be baptized in a baptism that was completely irrelevant to him should make us rethink how we undermine and undervalue baptism, how we make it small in our eyes. We see that this was a big deal for the church when it launched. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Baptism was such a big deal. You know, baptism was bigger for the first church where the apostles were than it is for churches today. And the reason I say that is baptism was rarely missing from their gospel presentations. So much so that it has brought confusion. Because when they are presenting the gospel, they add baptism there. And people begin to think, oh, baptism can, is also important for us to be saved. No, that wasn't the point. They were just showing the importance of baptism. Acts 2 verse 38, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. How many of us say that? You're out there preaching the gospel. We normally end on, end on repent and believe, isn't it? Not the apostles. Not the first church. Baptism was in there. Repent and show the evidence of that repentance that you have been saved by getting into that pool. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. This was the first Christian sermon. Baptism is there. When he tells them you are sinners. What must you do? Repent 
and don't forget baptism. Acts 10, another incident, this time with the Gentiles. In Acts 2.38, it's with the Jews. Acts 10.47, it's with Gentiles, non-Jews. Peter preaches to Cornelius and his family, and the Spirit of God dis descends upon them. What's the first thing on his mind? Baptism. Fill the pool up. Find water. That's the first thing on his mind. Acts 10, 47. Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. When did you last hear someone command someone else to be baptized? I'm insisting that baptism was bigger and greater and more important for the first century church than it is for us today. We have underestimated baptism. Even us who are baptized, we've underestimated it. It's missing in the vocabulary. You know, when someone tells you, you interrogate, are you a Christian? Yes. How did you become a Christian? And they, you know, give uh, a proper understanding of the gospel, how we are saved. We end there. Oh, good. We are going to heaven. So, it's okay. Not the first century church. They commanded. You have believed. I command you to be baptized. This is important. This should be a priority. Look at Acts 22 and verse 16. Paul is giving his testimony of salvation. And he says that Ananias who came to preach to him commanded him, there it is again, to be baptized. Acts twenty two sixteen. And now Paul, Ananias telling Paul, Paul is narrating his testimony, what happened. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Plead with God to save you and let's find a swimming pool and dip you in there. Let's find a bathtub and dip you in there. Paul says it was a priority. That's the first, that's the first formal act of a believer, of obedience. First formal act of obedience. The early church absolutely insisted on this. Absolutely insisted. They did not leave baptism out when they preached. They commanded the believers. If you are a believer here and you are not baptized, the apostles, if they rose from the dead and came, their mouths would drop. You've been a Christian for one year, two years, three years, ten years, and you are not baptized. Can you call the pastor here? We are firing the pastor. How do you have people running around in your church? And they are not baptized. Command them to be baptized. This is important. This is an optional. This isn't a good idea. This should be the first formal act of obedience for anyone who believes. Everything else followed and flowed from there. If you find anybody running a church, running a church ministry, out there doing evangelism, and they, you discover they haven't been baptized, tell them, stop. Tell them, stop this. Go and be baptized. What are you doing? Your first formal act of obedience is not going out there and beginning to preach and starting ministry. So get in the pool. Find somewhere to be baptized. This is important. And Jesus made it important. When even though he didn't need to be baptized, he had nothing to repent of. He was the spotless, sinless son of God. He went into those waters. No wonder the early church is everywhere. Come on. What are you waiting for? Jesus was baptized. Get in that pool. It's, uh, it's interesting. I had an example here and the person the example is about is in the audience, though they don't come to heal with you. Let's see if they will know themselves. Several years back at Kawata Baptist Church, the church we came out of, it was discovered that one of the members 
who had been a member for years, had not been baptized. Somehow this person slipped through the cracks, through the paperwork, and it, it, what did they do? They baptized. Can you join the next class? Quick, quick. Why? It's important. We've missed a step. We've jumped something. Everything starts from baptism. And Jesus made sure I started there. And I believe that it was meant to be an example. He could have launched it anywhere. His ministry. Anytime. There were times Jesus, he could have gone on the Mount of Transfiguration. You know that, huh? He could have gone on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, and uh, while the lights are beaming with Elijah there, Moses there, lights coming on top of the mountain, you know, a voice comes from, I mean, it happened, right? That's exactly what happened. No, he went in a pool to be baptized. So where is your mind at this morning? Hillview Baptist Church, are we underestimating baptism? Is it on our minds as we talk to people, whether in church or out there, I'm a Christian, are you baptized? No, I'm not yet baptized. Ah, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Get in there. Look at Acts 2. Look at Acts 10. Look at Acts 22. This is important. Look at Matthew 3. Jesus leads the way and makes his, form of, his first formal act of obedience, baptism. Where are you this morning? Are you under... Uh, overestimating baptism and thinking, no, I'm saved because I'm baptized. Wrong. We are saved through the death of the Son of God for our sins. When we place our trust in Him, God applies His death for our sins, His atonement to us. And that's how we are saved. Now, let me just come right out and say it. I think Jesus chose to be baptized to be an example. I know that's the unpopular idea. But uh, I think it was to be an example. And uh, it is true that Jesus is not primarily an example for us. He's primarily a savior. That Jesus didn't come down here primarily to live a life which we should do everything the way he did. That wasn't his primary goal. He lived a perfect life without sin so that, when, so that he would be the acceptable sacrifice to God for our sins. That was the idea. But we can't run away from the fact that at the back of Jesus' mind, there are certain things he did deliberately just so that he could be an example. One is suffering. The persecution he went through. What does he say in John chapter, is it 15 or 16? If the world, John 15, 18, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep your words. Jesus went through suffering that he could have easily avoided. He could have arrived on the day for crucifixion, preached a very offensive sermon, and be dragged straight to the cross. He could have done that. And on the day of his arrival, crucified, and the job is done. No. He spends his life on the earth. Suffering. Poverty. And even rejected by men. Hated by many. Why go through all that? To be an example. And if you're not convinced, 1 Peter chapter 2, actually it says it directly there. 1 Peter 2 verse 21, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. Yes, Jesus is primarily a savior, but we cannot minimize the fact that he also wanted to be an example. There are certain things he went through so that we would be sure to go through them. There are certain things the elders at Hillview Baptist Church do to be an example so that no one has an excuse. 
No, I couldn't come because I was busy. We are also busy, but we're there. It's to be an example. Even though it's not required, the, your leaders go an extra mile to be an, to be an example. And that's what we see Jesus do several times. And I believe that was his heart as he got into that baptism pool. The gospel comes, there, verse 24, he bore our sins in his body on the tree. We can't run away from it. He came to die from, uh, for our sins primarily to be our savior. That when we trust and believe in him, we will be saved. But we can't run away from the fact that Jesus, Jesus was setting up, why are we called disciples? Why are we called followers to walk the path that he walked? And he made baptism a big thing for believers, for the church, by setting this example. Second, every believer must be baptized because it is the believer's first step to come under authority. Every believer must be baptized because it is the believer's first step to come under spiritual authority. I missed the word spiritual there. Back to Matthew 3. Matthew 3 and verse 14 this time. My word to, to those of you who are believers, professing believers are not yet baptized, are the words of Jesus to John the Baptist. Let us fulfill all righteousness. Let's go beyond what is even required so that we, there is an example for those who will follow me. Uh, every believer must be baptized because it is the believer's first step to come under spiritual authority. Look at how this comes out for Jesus. Uh, in, in verse 14, John, it says, John would have prevented, in Greek that's a strong word, it's, it's, John resisted strongly. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? John was evidently uncomfortable with this, as I have mentioned. John's baptism was for sinners who had repented, who were believing in the ones who was to come. Jesus was no sinner. And, he, and, and uh, in fact, uh, People say the gospel comes out so beautiful here because Jesus Christ gets into the pool. It actually says in, I think, Mark or Luke's version that uh, Jesus joins the other people being baptized. And he joins the queue. And he joins the line. And as this one comes, they're baptized. Move on. This one and John, you know, sometimes when you're baptizing too many, you even forget who, who is who, and you're not seeing faces, you just want to get it over and done with. So I'm sure he grabbed Jesus, and he was ready to go down. As he was just about to dip, he looked at him. Ah! It's the Messiah! <laughs> hey, Jesus, please, please, please. What is going on? You wanted me to blunder. You wanted me to... I'm not supposed to be baptizing you. Let me strip. Hey, guys, get the clothes. He will baptize me. Strong negation, strong resistance. This cannot be because he didn't want to impugn sin on Christ. He didn't want these people to get the wrong idea that this was a sinner. But Jesus Christ did not mind for the sake of being this example. Now Jesus modeled here, and this is where I'm getting my point, Submission to spiritual authority. Think about this with me. John comes on the scene after 400 years of silence from God. God had not sent a prophet to say anything for 400 years. That's when John comes on the scene. We call it the intertestamental period. Complete and utter silence from God. After Malachi, dead quiet for 400 years. That's half a century almost. That, that's like from now going back to Martin Luther and John Calvin. 
long, long, long time, generations went by and God was completely silent. No new word after the death of Malachi. However, go to Malachi, uh, the very ending of Malachi. As if in anticipation of 400 years of silence. Malachi 4 verse 5 and 6. Malachi predicted that God would send a prophet. And he ended his prophecy by stating that. Malachi 4 verse 5 and 6. Behold... I will send you Elijah. This is how the book of Malachi ends. This is the ending. This is God's last word for 400 years. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn their, the hearts of their of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Who is this? Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet. Go back to Matthew, this time chapter 11. Jesus tells us who this Elijah, the prophet is, who came after 400 years of silence. Matthew 11, verse 13. If you haven't guessed that it's John the Baptist, then you are really dozing. In this long marathon, go out and refresh, then come back. Anyone following should have guessed Aye, that it's obviously going to be John the Baptist. Matthew 11, verse 13. For all the prophets, words of Jesus Christ, and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he, John the Baptist, is Elijah, who is to come. John the Baptist is the Elijah who Malachi talked about before 400 years of silence. Don't worry. Elijah will come. And he will pave the way before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Before the Messiah comes, Elijah will come and pave the way. That's the point there. Elijah and John the Baptist bear striking similarities. Go and do a study for yourself. So many striking similarities. Both were bushmen. Both were primitive. They wore animal skins and ate insects and wild things in the wilderness. In fact, uh, John the Baptist had to be followed into the wilderness for those who wanted his ministry and his baptism. They had to follow him in the wilderness. Uh, both of them suffered depression. Both of them were, were persecuted by women in power. And John the Baptist lost his life for it. Elijah was nearly killed for it. Striking similarities. But the point is this. The first official prophet of God from the last one in the Old Testament, Malachi, and after 400 years of silence, the first official pro prophet of God to come on the scene was who? John the Baptist. And guess what? Jesus says, I'll start my ministry under him. The last man standing. The only man standing. The only, the, the last prophet before the Messiah comes. Jesus says, I must begin my ministry with him knighting me. And the knighting is the baptism. I'll go and be baptized by him. And it's Jesus' way of coming under the spiritual authority of John the Baptist to be launched into ministry by John the Baptist. Emmanuel uh, shared with us yesterday in the morning a great meditation when we started our day of prayer and fasting about how I wish you, you were there to hear it about how uh, in Matthew the, the, the big theme is Jesus the king. Well, the baptism of Jesus is the king's coronation. The, the baptism of Jesus is, is the, the, if you want, you can call it the, the ordination of Jesus Christ. 
And you ask any elder, they will, ne they will tell you they, they will never forget the day of their ordination. It remains stuck indelibly in their mind. You wake them up all the time. Hey, when was the ordination? September? They'll wake up and tell you immediately. It's the biggest thing in their minds because of the weight of getting into this mission and getting into this ministry. And Jesus Christ says, I will be launched. The closest I can get to a church, the closest I can get to an elder, to ordain me, to launch me, to sanction my ministry, to show that my ministry is of God, is John the Baptist. I will come under his authority. And again, this is instructive for us who say we are disciples of Jesus. That baptism is not just the first foremost step of obedience of a believer, but it is how new believers come under the authority of the church and the leaders of the church. Baptism is the first time, think about it, is the first time you as a believer go to leadership of a church in your own capacity as a person and say, I want to be baptized. And you willingly submit to their scrutiny. You want to be baptized? Sit here. Let's probe. Let's ask questions. And sometimes at the end of the questions, the leaders say, no. You, you, there, there's something off here. There's something off here. We need to talk further. We need to pray further. We need to think further before we get you in the water. What's that? You are allowing the elders, the leaders of the church to, to take authority over you. You tell me the way I should go. You tell me what I should do. You, my life is open. Ask me what you will. And make a judgment about whether I am truly a Christian. Or. It's the first time you do it. It's the first time you do it. Baptism is the first time you come under and submit to spiritual authority. And all believers must have spiritual authority over them. Hebrews 13. Those of you who are dozing, it's an opportunity to refresh by turning the pages of your Bible. Hebrews 13. I picked a verse which is towards the last of the Bible. So that by the time you get there, you are awake again. Hebrews 13 verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls. As those who have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning for that would be of no advantage to you. Interesting that the writer of the Hebrews takes it for granted that all believers will be under spiritual authority. He doesn't say, those of you with leaders, please, you know, this is how you should behave, obey, uh-uh. It's taken for granted. Submit to your leaders. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls. Christians must be under spiritual authority. Some churches, when you attend two weeks, three weeks already, you are under their authority automatically. At Hillview, we have a more formal process. You sign up. You actually sign a paper. And some people get scared. Oh, how do we join? You sign here. Hey, hey. <laughs> I don't sign anyhow. I'm not ready to sign my life away to you people. I've just met you. Okay, fine. Get to know us and see if you'll be comfortable then. But you actually sign. It's a covenant where we as the leaders say we are taking charge as spiritual authority over your lives. And you say, I'm going to obey and submit to you as my spiritual leaders. You say, I'm giving you the right to probe my life. You ask the members here. We probe. Why aren't we seeing you? We probe. How is your marriage? I, we hear that you are in a relationship. Who are you seeing? Yeah. Can you bring them? Bring them here. We scrutinize them. 
What else do we do? Elders need to remind me of all the other things we do. Sometimes you are fighting at home, you course. We wake up, zero two. Wake up. What is going on? No, he didn't. What? She didn't. Hey, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, now, husbands, love your wives. <laughs> spiritual oversight. Spiritual leadership. When you are depressed, you call. Uh, when you fall into sin, you call. I've messed up. And uh, we, are, we make mistakes. We don't do our work perfectly. We are always wanting to do better, but we try our best. Why? Hebrews 13 says we'll give an account. In a sense, we want all of you who are believers to sign up. In a sense, we don't want. Because we fear that we have to give an account to God. That God will say, elders of Hillview Baptist Church, come forward. You baptized this account one by one. What happened to them? What became of them? These signed the paper to be your members. Account for their spiritual life. Did you protect my sheep that I died for? That's what Paul tells the elders at Ephesus on the island as he's praying. Guys, Christ died for the flock. And it's so precious to Christ. These people are so precious to Christ that even the devil wants them. They will some, he will raise some even among you as elders to fleece the sheep, to take advantage of them. And we hear it about, about it all the time. A pastor is sleeping with women who he should be taking care of spiritually. Pastors are, are milking people financially who they should be taking care of spiritually. Happens all the time. They're in trouble with the living God. He's going to say, how dare you play with that for which I died. It would have been better for a stone to be wrapped around your neck and thrown into the ocean. It would have been better for you that you were never born. The hottest place in hell is reserved for careless spiritual leaders. We fear. We want all of you to sign up because we want you to be obedient to God's word. But at the same time, we fear. Before these people sign up, will we manage? Are you under spiritual authority? Don't be a Christian hanging in the wind. You can disappear, you can reappear, and there is no spiritual oversight over your life. We, we need it. What are you going to tell God on Judgment Day? That's what I ask people who are not in membership anyway, under, who are not un, under any spiritual oversight. I say, how do you obey Hebrews thirteen seventeen? And I know a lot of you, you go and on Judgment Day, you say, he, he was my spiritual leader, even though you didn't sign. Let me tell you now, I'll refuse. <laughs> I'm sorry. We go, Christ, we had the process. Please, I preached, I explained. I think it's now between you and Christ. I us, me, us leave, it, leave us out of those discussions. Everyone. And I, I don't know where this is coming from. It is so common now to find people reformed. And they're not in, a, in membership anyway can sit in a church for one month, one year, five years, and you're just there. And I've made you a promise. I'll bury you. I'll, I'll bury you because you are coming here. You are tithing. Aye? <laughs> so minimum I can do is put you in your grave. So tell them, when I die, here's the number. Just call Pastor Mbewe. He already agreed to do the thing. But when we come on judgment day, there I'll say, please see. I'm not involved here. But uh, my only question to you is, if you are not in membership anywhere, how do you obey Hebrews 13, 17? Which leaders are there who you've given the authority to say, call me, come and visit me? Because we want to know where you are living. We want to know who your husband is. We want to know your children, your boyfriend, where you work, and so on and so forth. 
I want to be able to call you. Where are you? And I'm so grateful for you, the Baptist man. You know, we feel like we're bothering, at least I do, to be chasing you up. Where are you? Hey, where? But I'm shocked. I'm always shocked that people actually say, Pastor, thank you for, for checking up. Thank you for calling. Thank you for seeking me out. It's like they know they need someone watching over them. They know they can't be hovering. The wind will come and blow them off and take them away. The devil loves people who are not in membership anymore. He's got a few days with them. If Jesus could submit to the spiritual authority of John the Baptist, who are we? Who are we? Finally, you've done very well. We are now at the finish line. Third and final point. Every believer must be baptized because it is the believer's first step towards service and usefulness in the kingdom of God. Every believer must be baptized because it is the believer's first step towards service and usefulness in the kingdom of God. Three uh, scriptures in Isaiah. Very easy to remember. I want us to read all three and then we'll be done. Isaiah 11, Isaiah 42, Isaiah 61. Let's look at the three of those. Start with Isaiah 11. Um, we're getting this, by the way, from Matthew 3, verse 16. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens opened, were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Uh, this was Jesus' coronation. This was his commissioning. This was his ordination for ministry, for service, for usefulness, for accomplishing the task that God had given him. Baptism is the same idea for believers. Remember what I said. You find someone casting out demons, doing whatever, and they are not baptized. You have the authority to say, stop it. Nonsense. How did you skip the step of baptism? Go and be baptized. Then you can continue these activities that you are doing. It launches us. It's the first step towards service and usefulness in the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus was anointed for his ministry at his baptism. Isaiah 11, are you there? Oh, by the way, all those chapters, it's verse 1, verse 1. We all start from verse 1. So easy to remember. Isaiah 11, first verse 1. They shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. This is referring to Jesus. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Listen to verse 2. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of God. Jesus needed the spirit. Can you believe it? The Son of God, second person of the Trinity, needed the Spirit to come upon him and indwell him, to equip him for service. Chapter 42, Isaiah 42, beginning at verse 1. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, Again, referring to the Messiah, Jesus was to come. My chosen in whom my soul delights. And here comes the spirit. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. And a, fainting, a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Why didn't Jesus throw in the towel? He was indwelled by the Holy Spirit. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit on that day. Launched into ministry. And that's why he made it to the finish line. To suffer and bleed and die for us without tapping out. That's what took him through in the Garden of Eden. He needed additional help of angels 
to minister to him. But he had the spirit of God that had settled upon him. That had in that moment when he was saying, I don't think I can go through with this. I don't think I can carry their sins, their ugly, filthy, dirty sins upon my shoulders on that cross. We think he was afraid of nails. Rubbish. He wasn't afraid of nails. He wasn't afraid of bleeding. He wasn't afraid of dying. He was afraid of the wrath of God that would be poured upon him for our sins. God the Father told him, I will not spare you or take it easy on you because you are my son. If you choose to take on you these filthy, ugly sins of these wicked people, I'll give it to you and I won't hold back. Are you sure, Jesus? And in the Garden of Eden, he almost made a U-turn. He said, I don't think I can go through with it. The Spirit of God had filled him and he said, but not my will, but yours be done. And he died for our sins. And that's our hope. That's our only hope of salvation. All we do is plead for mercy. Trusting in the one who went through with the ugliest ordeal he could have ever faced. To take your sins and my sins on the cross. How did he see it through? Spirit of God. Spirit of God. Isaiah 61. <clears throat> this one just starts straight with the spirit. Doesn't waste time. As it talks about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is the most famous one. Eh? Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. That's what the Spirit of God has filled me to do. He needed the anointing of the Spirit to do his work. And guess where he chose for it to happen? In the baptism pool. He didn't need to, to be in there. But he chose for it to happen in the baptism pool. How big he has made baptism for us. In our sight. For him to say, I will not just command them to be baptized. I will be the first. Of those I redeem to be baptized. And they'll follow in my footsteps. And that's where the commissioning starts. We are worried to see people running around saving. And busy working for the Lord. And they haven't gone through the waters. We're worried. Where are they spiritually? What is their standing before God? Let's do first things first. Let them get in the pool. Doesn't matter how gifted you are when we find you and you are the most powerful preacher and you say, I'm not yet baptized, you say, ah, wait, let's baptize you. That should be your first step as you get into service to God and usefulness for God. In fact, baptism is merely showing outwardly what has happened spiritually, that we have experienced a spiritual baptism united with Christ in his death and in his resurrection, uh, uh, buried with him and leaving our sins there and rising with him, being filled by the Holy Spirit. You don't need to wait for another time and go to a papa to lay hands on you for baptism. It happened when you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us, it tells us that when you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13. It happened. Happened right there. And we say before, yes, it happened spiritually when you believed one month ago or two years ago. But we are waiting for the day you demonstrate it physically in the pool. Then we'll be comfortable now to launch you into it. We won't stand in your way. And we'll give you the opportunities for service. Well, brethren, these are the principles I wanted to bring to your attention. That Jesus models something for us here. 
and that baptism should be a big deal in our eyes. Baptism is the very first foremost step of obedience. Church membership would be a close second. And we must rejoice to see people baptized. Why? Because we are seeing people take the first foremost step of obedience. Baptism must excite us because we are seeing people taking the first step towards coming under authority. By nature, we hate authority. That's one of the marks that you're dealing with a Christian. Why should someone come and submit themselves when they can be out there freely doing whatever they want? Nobody's calling them. They come in when they want. They disappear. When they... It feels good, you know, for those who are not saved. Those who are saved and dominated by God's spirit say, I need someone watching over me. I need this a community. Let's do it. Let me come under authority, spiritual authority for the sake of my soul. That's what the text says. They are watching over your soul. They are watching to make sure you don't end up in hell. Because when we keep talking to you and admonishing you and nothing is changing, we won't be shy to come and tell you, my friend, I don't think you are saved. Yes, we baptized you, we believed your testimony, but from the way you are living, from your stubbornness to the clear teaching of scripture, from your stubbornness to continue in your sins, you are not saved. You you, you may hate us, but we would rather tell you the truth and go before God with clear conscience. We would rather say we got it wrong, but we did our best to tell them what we could see. True believers care about that. They want that for their lives. And finally, we should rejoice to see the baptism, excited to see the baptism pool because we are seeing people take the first step to what? Service and usefulness in the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for your word and for the model that Jesus Christ sets. He did not need to get into that pool. He did not need to travel hundreds of miles to go and launch his ministry in that pool. But he did it for us. He didn't want to give us instructions that he did not model himself. Help us to follow our master. The servant is not greater than his master. Help us, for, give us back a big, a big idea of baptism. Help us put baptism right up there once again where it belongs in our minds. Even those of us who have been baptized, may our gospel presentations, like those we see in Acts, not be devoid of the command, be baptized. Repent. And be baptized. Believe and be baptized. We thank you for these brothers and sisters who have taken this step. We thank you for the outward way in which they have demonstrated what has happened to them inwardly. May this be the launch of many years of usefulness, of service. May this be the launch of them coming under spiritual authority. May they be blessed as they take, as they have taken this first foremost step of obedience. Do these things, we ask. Bless the fellowship that remains and the meal that we'll partake of. For Jesus' sake. Amen. All right. If we're in a Pentecostal church, I would have said clap for me. I only took an hour. I only took an hour. All that in an hour, you know, it was a tight, it was a tight one, but uh, I put it off. So you can't be too angry with me. Let's stand and sing together um, the one we're singing. Happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior and my God.